serving for you, uh, with you, uh, for the month of January. And so glad that you're here on such a overcast day. Um, as you'll notice in the bulletin, next Sunday, if I think I have this right, there will be the annual voters meeting. And it's going to be at 1130 if I finish on time. So, but otherwise, uh, we'll have that there. This coming Tuesday is council meeting, so those who serve on the council be aware of that. Uh, if you are joining us by, the, by a computer at home, we welcome you to worship service, and we welcome also you to our worship service. Let us go to the Lord, give him our thanks and praise for who he is, and especially that Jesus is the sent one. And we'll talk more about that in our sermon. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sin, O Lord, who could stand? But with, with you, you there is forgiveness. forgiveness. Therefore, we are here. 
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we confess to the Lord. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin Sin is covered. Blessed Blessed is is the man man against against whom whom the Lord Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit spirit there there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried as by the heat of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. join together. Have Have mercy mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. So, so that, that you are justified in your words, words and, and blameless in your judgment. God's word of love for you. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Celebrate God's love for you. Son and Holy 
behold my servant, who I uphold, my chosen, and whom my soul delights. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Glory be to the Father, and, and to, to the, the Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, now and, and will be forever. forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River, proclaimed him your beloved Son, and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Make all who are baptized in his name faithful in their calling as your children and inheritors with him of everlasting life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading on this first Sunday of Epiphany is from the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. And our epistle is from Romans, chapter 6, beginning at the first verse. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can he we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ, into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus is 
Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, Lord. John the Baptist appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw heaven, the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We join together in confessing our faith in our triune God using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is that gospel reading about Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist. <clears throat> if you're friends in Christ. We are in this new year of the church. It started first Sunday in Advent. And we are going to be looking at the Gospel of Mark as most of our Gospel readings for this entire year. So get used to Mark. Now, you didn't have Mark during Christmas because Mark doesn't have the Christmas story in his Gospel. But that's why we were in John's Gospel and in Luke's Gospel because it showed us that more of what we are used to as the Christmas story. But now that we're past that, you will be reading mainly from Mark's Gospel. Once in a while you'll get uh, a reading from John's Gospel. But Mark's Gospel is the shortest, shortest Gospel of the four Gospels, and many biblical scholars believe that this was the first Gospel written. Now, even though it's short, it's very active, and you will see how fast Mark runs through things and how short they might be compared to other writers of the Gospels. One of the main words that Mark uses is the word immediately. And it's just kind of be pop at you over and over again. Immediately this happened. Immediately that happened. Because Mark's intent is to show you that Jesus is the sent one. The one that God had promised even from the beginning of time in the garden. And that through all of his activities, you will see that Jesus truly is the Son of God. Now, just to talk about how fast things go in Mark, in the Gospel of Matthew, it takes four and a half chapters to get to the calling of the disciples. Four and a half chapters. In, in um, Luke, it takes four chapters to get to the calling of the disciples. In John, it's a little less. It takes 37 verses to get to the calling of the disciples. But in Mark, it only takes 13 verses. So really, right after what we heard today, we're going to have a couple of verses about Jesus in the wilderness, and then he's calling his disciples. That's how fast Mark is going to take us through the life of Jesus so that we might concentrate only on him as our Savior and Lord. Mark's gospel will not quote the Old Testament many times. Right before our gospel reading today, there is a quote from the Old Testament, and it's from Isaiah. It talks about there's one coming who is going to make straight the way of the Lord. But after that, Mark doesn't usually go back to the Old Testament to try to show people things. His main focus is on Jesus and his activities. He's willing to let Jesus' miracles and Jesus' comments be the things that will show you and show me and show the world that Jesus is the Messiah. Mark will cover over 19 miracles of Jesus, and he will do so with vivid and victorious language. And all of this in Mark is to show us who Jesus is. Most people believe that Mark's gospel was written for Gentiles because he doesn't have the Old Testament that much. He does give explanation to Jewish terminology throughout his gospel. And so if it was written for people who were not Jews, it was written to invite them, as it invites you and me, to come and to let Jesus be the sent one. You won't find too many discourses of Jesus in Mark's gospel. You will not find the Sermon on the Mount in Mark's gospel. He is more interested in focusing just on what Jesus is, who Jesus is and what he does. The first verse of chapter 1 in Mark says these words. In the beginning of the gospel, in the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's it. And then he goes into the quote from Isaiah and right into today's thing. So Mark begins his gospel by making a statement that Jesus is the Son of God. And Mark will basically end his gospel by making a statement that Jesus is the Son of God, but by a little twist. It doesn't come from necessarily a believer. It comes from that centurion at the cross, at the crucifixion. And after Jesus cries out his last and dies, he hear, you hear him say, this man truly was the Son of God. 
So at the beginning and at the end, Mark wants us to know that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And as we kind of talk about it here in our gospel reading, at this baptism, Mark sets out, using God's own voice, the Father, which we hear in other gospel readings also, to say, this is my Son. I have sent him for you. Now, there are many examples of God sending people and things in the Old Testament. You might remember Joseph, that man with the coat of many colors that was sold into slavery by his brother into Egypt, went into Potiphar's house, was blessed, but then, you know, was thrown in the prison. And after years and years, finally becomes second in command of the entire country of Egypt. He knows the dream, seven years of plenty, seven years of nothing. And so he does things to prepare Egypt and the world for the coming time of nothing. It's when Joseph's brothers come to him to get food. You might remember that. And he finally reveals himself to him. Joseph says these words to his brothers, incredible words. After all that he's experienced, he said these to him. And now, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant and to keep alive for you many survivors. So do not, so it is not you who sent me here, but God. We might think of Moses, who was out in the wilderness taking care of sheep, and the burning bush came, and God says, I'm sending you to Egypt to get my people out and lead them to the promised land. And Moses said, well, who am I going to say sent me? Well, they won't even understand. It says, God said, you tell the people, I am that sent me to you. And through many miraculous signs, all through the 40 years of wilderness and even in Egypt, Moses keeps saying, you will know that I am sent by God through these indications of signs. But Joseph and Moses, even though they are a Savior-like person, They are not the sent one. Moses and Joseph does not save people from the curse of sin. The Old Testament reading, Old Testament readings give us uh, many examples of God sending things. In Numbers 9, 23, we are told that God sent an evil spirit. Something that we might say, wow, can he send an evil spirit? But he sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the leaders of that day, because God was going to remove Abimelech for all the sins that he had done. In 1 Chronicles 32, 21, we hear that God sends an angel who cuts off all the mighty warriors and commanders and officers in the camp of the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria had come up to Jerusalem and said, we're going to take it. And after all the bragging, God says, watch, I will take care of this. This is my battle. And he destroys the Assyrian army. There are many examples in scripture of angels coming and rescuing people and saving people. We remember uh, the three men in the fiery furnace and God comes in an angel and protects them from that fire and that heat. We remember Daniel thrown into the lion's den and an angel comes and shuts the mouth of those lions so that he is saved. The book of Hebrews actually tells us that angels are ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. To you and me, God has sent out to you and me his angels to minister to us. Now, we might say, well, maybe we see him, maybe we don't. But you need to understand that God loves you so much that he has given angels as mentoring, ministering spirits to you. And we hear many times in the Old Testament where God sent prophets to his people. 
to call them back to repentance from their evil ways of, of living life. And we know from the history that they didn't usually listen to those. And we might remember even Jesus as he was looking over Jerusalem and he said these words, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wing, and you, but you would not be willing. You were not willing. None of these Old Testament prophets or leaders or even ministering spirits is the one sent to save us from our sins. Starting with the baptism of Jesus and the voice of God saying that Jesus is his beloved son, the writer of Mark begins the ministry of Jesus, the sent one, sent from his father for you and me. When you go look at the Gospel of John, you will find many times where Jesus will say, I am sent from the Father, or the Father has sent me. And that is true. He has been sent. Paul kind of sums up all of this about Jesus being the sent one in, in Galatians 4, verse 4, where he writes, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his own Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And then the Apostle John also gives a wonderful summary of this sent one in where he says in his first letter in chapter 4, verse 10, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. All of this should make us happy. All of this should make us stand in awe of God and what he has done for you and me and for the world, sending his own son to be our savior and our redeemer. Well, what does that mean today in 2021? I want to say because Jesus was sent by God, there is nothing in this world, nothing at all in this world that is better than having Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. Nothing compares to him. Nothing will ever come close to him. It doesn't matter what the world's able to accomplish and what we're able to accomplish as human beings. We will never come close to accomplishing what God has done in sending his son, Jesus Christ, for you and me. In Jesus' ministry, he even sends. He sent his disciples out to prepare the towns that he was going to be going to before he got there. And he told them what to do and what to say and how to act. And then after the resurrection, as he stood before his disciples as that resurrected Lord and King, he said, even as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. We know that great command, that great commandment and that great commission that has been given to us. Go into all the world and proclaim God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, baptizing people and teaching them everything that Jesus has taught us and what the scripture says. And we hear about the witness. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God is sending us just as he sent his own son. And today, the world needs us going to them. The world needs the sent one. He needs people like you and me to proclaim him as the only hope and, and salvation for human beings and even this world. Now, I don't know much about the valley. I don't know who lives here necessarily in the breakdown of demographic stuff in Port Isabel. I don't know what the future looks like for Port Isabel, and what, the dem what people are saying is going to happen in Port, Port Isabel. But I know this. 
as your members of Fishers of Men, God has put you here. Even if you're just coming down for the winter, he has put you here so that you might be witnesses, that you might be sent to this community. I don't know how God's going to send you. I don't know how he's going to use you. You're already doing a number of things to help people. But what is he leading you to in the future? He has called you to be ministers, all of you, to the people in the valley. This last week, our nation went through a whole bunch of terrible things and kind of drawing people up in questions and not understanding what the future might be. I actually talked to a, a friend of mine last night who was very upset at the outcome of the election for president, the outcome for the election in Georgia. And uh, we, we talked about that a little bit. I, I want you to know that there is no salvation in the Republican Party or in the Democratic Party. There is no salvation. They're not going to bring you forgiveness of sins. They're not going to bring you eternal life. Now, we thank God that he gives us a system of government where we have things that we can say and we have the right to go vote. But I want you to know if you were looking for somebody or some party or some man who was going to become president of the United States to save you, you're looking in the wrong place. It'll never happen. President Trump is not our savior. President-elect Biden is not our savior. Jesus is our savior. He is the one sent by God to be our redeemer, the one who loves us. We aren't guaranteed through scripture that the United States of America will continue forever until the end of time. Countries have been here and gone. I don't know what the future is for our country or for the world, but I do know this. God will not leave himself without a witness that are gonna, is going to come through his people, you and me. So don't trust in the things of this world. Don't trust necessarily just that you might say, well, as soon as I get the vaccine, then I'm going to be saved from everything. No, you're not. All of us will die unless Jesus comes again while we're alive. Otherwise, we're going to face everything that everybody before us faced, except you and I will do that in faith, thanking and praising God that he sent Jesus as his son to us. Everyone needs to have that joy, that confidence, that sure assurance, no matter what is happening around them, no matter what might be good or bad, whether the stock market goes up or whether the stock market goes down, Everyone needs to have what John the Baptist started his gospel with, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he and he alone is the Savior of the world. And so as you begin to listen to the Gospel of Mark in the Gospel readings, I want you to listen to his activities, Jesus' activities, and I want you to celebrate and be full of joy because of who Jesus is for you and for everyone else. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us stand for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for sending your son into this world to be our savior. You have given us a blessing that is beyond our comprehension, a blessing that nothing can match, nothing can come close to, so we thank you. Your only son coming into this world as a human being to go to the cross, to be crucified, to die, to be buried, and then to be raised from the dead so that you, so that we would have great confidence that we too will live forever with Jesus. Father, we thank you that Jesus living in us allows us to live a new life, 
a life that finds its strength and its joy and its rock and its fortress in what you have given us, the gift of your only Son. Father, we come to you today asking for your blessing on our country. Yes, we do ask for blessing. We ask, Father, that our leaders would look to you and would not just look to themselves and their own wisdom as to what we need to be doing as a country. We pray that you would raise up godly leaders for our country. We look in the past. We have to confess that our country and our leaders have not always followed you. Forgive us and help us to proclaim to everyone that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Wisdom comes from you. So bless our country with that type of wisdom so that peace may abound and we might be able to be ministers not only to people in this country but throughout the world sharing Jesus as Savior. Father, we pray for President Trump as he's in his last few days and we pray for President-elect Biden. Father, we look to you. Guide them. Help them. Give them your wisdom. Let your word be alive in them. We pray for our Congress. We pray for the state of Texas and other states. We pray for the mayor of this city and for all who serve us. Fill them with your, your presence. And Father, we also come to you praying for those who are in need of your healing, especially encouragement as they experience life. Father, let them know that you have never abandoned them and never will abandon them, that you are with them, that you are the one that will uphold them. Father, give them that confidence. Give us that confidence. Father, also we pray for people who are really struggling right now, maybe financially, maybe in other ways. We ask, Father, that you would anoint them with your peace and that you would give them that assurance of your love. These and the other things that we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ who has taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.
Friday, the Bible class will be on the interrogation of the man born blind and how that points us to Jesus again as our Savior and Lord. Have a great week in Jesus.